So I, uh, I've, been, I've been going through my usual mood swings, you know, and uh, this week, and so I had a weird prayer, and uh, and I prayed that God would find a way to um, to surprise me with His love. You, you, and usually, you know, I, things are predictable in my world, you know. It's bad, and then it's worse, and then it's worse. You know, it's pretty predictable. So I said, Lord, surprise me. Surprise me with your love. All week long, I looked and looked, and, and I was not surprised. Even when good things happened, it was like, oh, yeah, sure. You know, that's, yeah, sure, sure you betcha. And, uh, <laughs> and so last night, I was at home, and I was uh, preparing, and I had a stack of these commentaries. Uh, this is what pastors use to make sure they got the names <laughs> right, things like that. And uh, this is a big, thick one. It was... Uh, Years ago, in the 80s, it was $37, so it's probably worth about 25 cents now. But, um, and obviously it's well used. Um, so I was, I was at home in the, in the living room, and I was uh, sitting there reading different ones, and I picked this one up and, and uh, started in uh, looking at our passage in Hosea, which um, was the one we're gonna look at today. And there were several crisp $100 bills. <laughs> I was like, wow, where did that come from? It was the weirdest thing. I, I got my own kingdom challenge going. Okay. And, and, and uh, that was a surprise. I want to tell you, I'm going to start looking at all the commentaries now. <laughs> Just to be sure. So, if you have a Bible with you, you're welcome to turn to Hosea. In, in my Bible, it's page 804, which means nothing to you, probably. <laughs> it, it's completely irrelevant. But um, I want to read the passage towards the end of it, and then we're going to go back a bit, start at the beginning, and, and ramp up to this. Okay? Will you, are you with me on that? Okay. So... Uh, Hosea 11, God speaking. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called him. But the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. They sacrificed to the uh, fertility gods, the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught them to walk, taking them in my arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness. I led them with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feed them. But will they not return to Egypt and will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? Swords will flash in their cities and will destroy the bars of their gates and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. And then verse 8. How can I give up on you? How can I hand you over? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I turn and devastate. For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come in wrath. Isn't that a great promise? Pray with me. Lord Jesus, teach us how we might see your tender hand, teaching us to walk, leading us, drawing <coughs> us to you. And Lord, give us the courage to, to actually repent and turn back to you so we know your love. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, last week, I mentioned we were looking at Jonah, and I said, you know, I feel most uh, affinity with Jonah. Uh, he was sort of the relentlessly depressive, angry, uh, <laughs> frightened, fleeing, unfaithful person. You know, so I thought, well, that's me. Hosea, I do not identify with, I'm happy to say. I have, I have nothing in common with Hosea. His marriage is not my marriage, and I want, to, I want to put that right out there as we start, okay? <laughs> Better not be, I mean, Seth. Better not be. So, here's the deal. Um, 
This is why I believe that the Bible is for adults only and children should not be allowed to read it. Um, have you ever uh, used that phrase, you know, walk a mile in my shoes? You know, if they would just, you know, see what I've seen or live what I've lived, then they would have a better perspective. I think that's at the core of what happens in this book of Hosea. God says to Hosea, I want you to walk a mile in my shoes. I want you to know what it's like to be me. I want you to know how it feels to be in a relationship like I am with my people. And so, chapter 1, the word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the reigns of King Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam. Okay, so we got the context. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go and take yourself an adulterous wife and children of that unfaithfulness. Because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery and departing from the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim. He was glad to get his name in there. Uh, and she conceived and bore him a son. And then it talks about the, the children, actually three children that were born. And uh, it's a very strange thing because here you, God's saying, okay, the people are unfaithful to me. They've turned away from our covenant. They chase after other, they chase after fertility gods, actually. Uh, the Baal cult was big in that. And, uh, and um, they don't love me. And I want you to know how that feels so that you can preach it. So go out there and find a wife who's not going to love you but who will love everybody else. And, um, and then let's talk about that. And so this book is the talk about that. So he goes out and he, and he marries uh, this woman who was a, a prostitute and um, brings her home and they have a child which he gives the name uh, Jezreel, which uh, is named after a city that was devastated by the enemies. So every time they call their child, they're gonna remember devastation. And then she gets pregnant. It doesn't say that Hosea is the dad, but she gets uh, pregnant and, uh, and has a, a, another child, um, uh, Lo Ruhama. And Lo means um, not. It's like the opposite, you know. And so what this means literally is, um, uh, I love you not. <laughs> that's, that's what the name means. I love you not. So every time they called the daughter, hey, I love you, not, come on over. You know. So you would always know that uh, she wasn't loved. And then the sister came along and was named Lo Ami, uh, which means you're not my child. <laughs> Talk about naming, you know. Uh, there's power in the names. So every time you call the third kid, uh, Technically, literally, probably meant uh, like pastor only starts with a B, you know. <laughs> uh, and so uh, these were the names of the children that Hosea raised. And so there was a living testament in his family to the people all around. Every time he called the kids to dinner. Devastation, I don't love you and you're not mine. Come on in. And so this shaped Hosea's message. And so his message goes out and talks about how God is upset with the people because they have turned from their covenant relationship and they, and they are following after others and, they, and they're looking for uh, answers everywhere but in their relationship with the Lord. And there's an impending sense of what their heritage is, is destruction not loved and not mine. Right? That's their their future. That's their heritage. And I thought, well, you know, that's pretty bad. That's a that's gonna be a tough sermon. And then I got to chapter three. Evidently Gomer went back to work. You know, the kids were getting older. 
She went back to work. So the Lord said, go again and show your love to your wife. Though she's loved by others and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. You know, it's like donuts back then. Um, <laughs> so he went out. Get this, he buys her back from the pimp. Yes. For 15 shekels of silver, a homer and a lethic of barley. Now, homer literally means a pile. So it's a pile and a half of barley and 15 pieces of silver. He pays off the pimp and brings his wife home. There's happiness in Hosea's house. <laughs> and then it goes on and on. He has a pretty rugged message here for this because he's feeling it, you know. Now, I look at this and I go, my goodness, perhaps... Hosea in the scriptures is the root of country western music. <laughs> I mean, you think about this. I, I, I know I did. My mind went right to it. And I started thinking, oh my goodness, this is a country song if there ever was one. And so um, I went back to the great philosophers. I went back through history and I found, I found the fruit of this scripture. This is from Lyle Lovett, who is a fabulous uh, philosopher, theologian. <laughs> Listen to this. Who keeps on trusting you when you've been cheating, spending your nights on the town? And who keeps on saying that he still wants you when you're through running around? And who keeps on loving you when you've been lying, saying things ain't what they seem? God does. But I don't. God will. But I won't. That's the difference between God and me. So who says he'll forgive you and says that he'll miss you and dream of your sweet memory? God does. But I don't. God will. But I won't. That's the difference between God and me. Wow. Hosea to music. God does. Even when we won't. Right? And love us and forgive us. This, is the, this is actually becomes the message. Now, about halfway through the book, just so you know, there, there's this um, uh, a partial response from the people. They say, wow, things are bad. Things are really bad. Let's return to the Lord. He's torn us to pieces, but he'll heal us. He's injured us, but he'll bind up our wounds. And after two days, he'll revive us. Shouldn't take long. And on the third day, he'll restore us. And then we'll just live in his presence. He'll come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. And then God's response is, your love is like an early morning dew. It's there and then it is gone. It burns off real fast. So even when the people make an effort to kind of superficially turn and say, well, let's, you know, God will fix us up. Let's just, you know, turn to him for a little bit. It was, it was like the song that uh, Jeremy and Jenna sang. Uh, just, just now before the sermon, when they're singing about, I want to, I want to praise you from the inside. Now, they wanted to praise God from the outside, on the surface, on the superficial, and God's saying, I know that, I get that. Uh, it doesn't work for me. And then He says this: I desire mercy, not sacrifices, and I acknowledge the and the acknowledgement of God I desire rather than burnt offerings. God wants the real thing. He wants the real transformation. He wants us to really know Him. Not just superficially. Well, I'll go to church and that'll fix stuff up. Trust me, I've been in church a lot of my life. It didn't fix anything up. What does is the worship from the inside. The turning from the inside and then letting the transformation work its way out. Not just superficially saying, well, if I get three weeks out of four in church, I think everything will be okay. I'll just go back to my pimp. 
That's a biblical. Right. Now, you have this really strong image of the marrying the unfaithful spouse and the kids, you know, you're not mine. That's the sweet baby. Um, and then Hosea shifts the image suddenly. And instead of talking about the unfaithfulness of the spouse, it's almost word for word the story of the prodigal son in chapter 11. Isn't that weird? It's about the, the, the kid who was loved, cared for, nurtured, encouraged, who can't receive that. And that's what I want us to look at for a minute here. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called him, and the more I called, the further he went from me. One of my favorite uh, verses probably in the whole Bible is in chapter 11. Because it talks uh, about the ways God pulls us. I led them with cords of human kindness. I drew them with bands of love. Isn't that a great image? This is how God wants to do it. Even if we've run away, even if we've gone our own way, even if we've been disobedient, even if we've disappointed ourselves or embarrassed ourselves, no matter what, if we could see God drawing us with cords of kindness and compassion, it could change everything. Because usually we, we, we disappoint ourselves, we embarrass ourselves, and or we rebel against God, and then we go, well, God's going to be angry, so I better not go back. Right? Better not. And yet if we could grasp that he's drawing us with cords of compassion and holding us with ties of love, then we're free to go back. And that opens the door for us to do what uh, Israel is being called on here, which is this repentance. And you know, it's, it's awkward preaching about repentance, by the way. No, I mean, not to you all, because you probably don't need it. But, you know, in some churches where they need it, um, I'll be telling you what that's like. You preach about repentance, and they think that you're being scolding. You know, and as a pastor, you get seen as the angry parent. Why doesn't he ever preach something positive, you know, like tithing? You know, this is the only sermon that gets people wanting a stewardship message. Yeah. You know, it's the only one. Because repentance talks about literally turning around and stopping the way you're going and turning around and going back another way. And that's what God's calling us to do. And that's what he's, he's inviting the people of Israel to do through this uh, this prophet's message is that you're going this way, not just make a reversal and go back. And that can't be done superficially. It's not like you, do, you, you juke them out of their socks like a football player and you start to go back and then you don't really, you know, you go that way. It's, it's the real reversal. And it has to come from the inside. And uh, I think it's time for us to experience repentance again. To actually examine our lives and say, Lord, where am I going in the wrong direction? Uh, yesterday at the at the men's breakfast, Larry was leading uh, the devotional in the in Proverbs, and he talked about the um, what was that string, Larry? The um, chalk, chalk line. line. The chalk line. The chalk line that 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 lets you know if you're out of uh, kilter a little bit. Now. My dad actually was a contractor too. And, uh, and so, you know, usually it was that 50 cents an hour to stay out of the way, but every once in a while he needed someone to hold the chalk line. And so I actually know what this illustration's about. You know, and you get the chalk thing out there, and you, do it and, you have, and you snap it when it's pulled tight, and you get a straight line, and then you see if anything's out of kilter. Isn't that a great visual, you know? and. Um, and I think that that's what we need to allow in our lives where we let God's word be a chalk line for us and, and his love for us direct us so we see where we need to be and how we've gotten off track. So if we're off track just a little bit, 
by the time we get there, we're way out there. And that's what my dad kept trying to explain to me. I go, what's it matter? You know, I mean, if it's off a little bit, this foundation. <laughs> he goes, well, you know, one of the goals is we want it to, you know, stand up and everything. And if you know, one wall's going this way, one wall's kind of going out that way, it doesn't really matter the first couple of inches. It really doesn't. You can't even see the difference. But when you get out there at the other end of the house, where the heck did that wall go? He said, that's why we need that, because, because it, at the start, it doesn't seem like it's off. Right? And isn't that the way it is in our lives? When we, when we start down some journey, it doesn't feel like we're off that much. Just a little, you know, maybe. Maybe not, might be attitudinal. Maybe not really off. And, and it's only when we get down the road and, and look over and we go, oh my gosh, I'm somewhere else. How did I get here? And I think that breaks God's heart. I think that breaks his heart because if we can believe the scripture, he loves us. His compassion and kindness and, and he wants us to be in his loving relationship with him. He wants us to know his love and his power and his life and all these things. And he wants our life to be good and, and centered in him. And he doesn't want us to be off somewhere. So he draws us back with cords of compassion, kindness, bands of love. I, I wrote about this passage in, in the Getting Past uh, What You Never Get Over book because uh, when we're talking about uh, regret in our life, um, I said that regret is like the bungee cords of our heart that you know we. we go forward and then boom, it pulls us back, you know that. And uh, we just can't seem to get away. And, uh, and I thought, what is it that would be an antidote for uh, the bungee cord of our regret? It's being pulled by other cords, by God's cords of compassion and kindness and, and his bands of love. It's, it's, it's that pull that keeps us from going back into our uh, the results of our of our sin and our missing the chalk line. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this? How do we go forward knowing that God loves us? He doesn't want to wreck our life. He hurts for us. And he longs for us to repent, to, to turn around and, and come back to him. He longs for that. What are we going to do? Um, I think the first thing we have to do is acknowledge his love for us. Because if we miss that, we're not going back. Who wants to go back and get smacked around by an angry God? But if we, can, if we can take hold of his love, like, like he takes hold of us, that frees us up to say, okay, I can let go of going my own way. Right? My own way. Um, of me determining the steps that seem so much like God's will at the beginning. It's only when we're out there that we end up somewhere else. I want to invite you to come back. To literally come back to the Lord. And you might have been following him for a long time and you might have been thinking, you know, I got this figured out. Or you might be poking your head in church and wondering what weird thing the pastor's going to say next, you know, which everyone wonders that, you know. I, I think it's time to come back. And, and I want you to invite you this week, today, to turn around. To turn around toward the Lord. And allow Him to pull you back to Him. Pull you with cords of compassion, kindness, and ties of love, and pull you back to Him. 
then start out in a new way. Could you do that this week? Would that be all right? Okay. Lord Jesus, give us the courage to turn back to you. Give us the courage to, to begin to trust you all over again. Give us the courage to let go of our, our willfulness and our desire to be right and our need to be in control, all those things. Lord, we thank you that we turn back towards your love. So pull us. Pull us and hold us today as only you can. Amen.